Hello everybody and welcome to another A-Level Chemistry exam question walkthrough video. In this video we're going to be taking a look at two questions from the rate equations topic. And in this video I will walk us through the context of the question and show you my thinking about the question in blue and then the answers that are going to get you the marks will be written down in green. In this first question, we are asked to calculate the order of reaction with respect to two chemicals, P and Q. Now, rate equations generally follow the structure rate of reaction is equal to the rate constant multiplied by the concentration of one reactant, in this case P, raised to the power of something, and that's what we don't know, and then that's multiplied by the concentration of the second chemical, Q, raised to another power that we don't know. And these two values, the indices, the powers that the concentration terms are raised to, those are called the order with respect to, on this occasion, P. And this value here would be the order with respect to the concentration of Q. And what we have to do here is we have to use the data from these three experiments to work out what the order of reaction is for P and Q. And so in questions like this, what we need to be able to appreciate is actually, you know, what the table is showing us. So the idea here is they do an experiment and the first time they do an experiment, there is a certain concentration of chemical P and a different concentration of chemical Q. And the rate of reaction is measured and this is that rate of reaction. And then they repeat the experiment, only this time with different starting temperatures of chemicals P and Q and a different rate of reaction and then they do it a third time with a different set of concentrations and a different rate of reaction and so the idea is that we look at how each of the experiments is different to each other and make a deduction about what the rate of reaction is for each of the concentrations involved and so it doesn't really matter which one you start with that let's start with chemical P and so if we're looking for P, we need to find two experiments where the concentrations of P are different from one experiment to the next. And so we can't choose two and three because it's the same concentration in both of those experiments. So if we consider experiment one and experiment two, the concentration of P is double in experiment one what it is in experiment two. And so it doesn't matter which direction you go in, it seems to me to make much more sense to go from experiment two to experiment one here, because comparing experiment two to experiment one, the concentration of P is twice as big. And it's much easier, I think, to think in terms of multiples. The concentration of Q is the same in experiment one and experiment two. So what that means is any change in rate of reaction is down entirely to the change that we cause to happen in concentration of P. And so what we can see when we compare those two rates of reaction, first of all, is they're not the same. And that's significant because what that tells us is that the order with respect to P is definitely not zero order. We can rule that out because if it was zero order, that concentration would not have changed, even though we changed the concentration of P. So our two remaining options for A-level chemistry are first order or second order. Now, if it is first order, whatever we do to chemical P's concentration, the rate of reaction will experience that same proportionate change. So on this occasion, what we've done is we've doubled P, but the concentration, when we do 7.6 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by 1.9 times 10 to the minus 3, we see that the concentration has had the effect of quadrupling the rate. What that means in terms of the maths of the rate equation is we've doubled the concentration and the rate has been doubled and raised to the power of the order, which is 2. And so that's why our change is a factor of four. So that means that the order of reaction with respect to P, we just need to write is second order or two. Doesn't matter which we write there. And just to repeat what we've done, if you have a look up at the rate equation, we have multiplied P by two, which has then been raised to the power of whatever the power of P is. And that's had the effect of making the rate four times bigger. And what that means is that the concentration of P must have been doubled and then squared to make the rate four times bigger. So second order. Now we need to look for the order with respect to chemical Q. And this time let's use two and three. 
and this time it's again, it's nice and straightforward because P has been unchanged between experiment two and experiment three. But what we've done is we've doubled the concentration of chemical Q. And we can see again that that definitely means that Q is not zero order because those two rates of reaction aren't equal. But what we can see is as we've doubled the concentration of Q, the rate of reaction has gone from 1.9 to 3.8, which is also doubled. And that means it's first order, because remember, th those are our only three options. Zero order, definitely not, because the rate would have been unchanged. First order, which means our doubling of the concentration has led to a doubling of the rate. And that is what's happened because the standard form is the same number both times. So that is first order with respect to Q. Then the question moves on to take us to a different set of chemicals, this time R and S. We've been told that the order with respect to chemical R is 1, in other words, first order, and the order with respect to S is 2. So we've been asked to write the rate equation, and rate equations are always constructed as I did at the top. Rate is equal to K, that should be where you start. And then you multiply it by the concentration of one of the chemicals, doesn't matter which one you start with, I'm going to start with R, raised to the power of its order, which is 1, multiplied by the concentration of S, raised to the power of its order, which is 2. And then we need to calculate a value for the initial rate of reaction when the concentration of R is 0.16 and S is 0.84. And so we literally just have to substitute those values in. And so rate is equal to K, which is 4.2 times 10 to the minus 4, multiplied by the concentration of R, 0.16, raised to the power of 1, multiplied by the concentration of S, 0.84, raised to the power of 2, which when we put all that together gives us 4.7 times 10 to the minus 5. And that's going to be three marks, one for the rate equation, one for the substituted values in the rate equation, and one for our final value for the rate of reaction. And then they tell us about a second experiment performed at a different temperature, T2, and they're giving us a new initial rate of reaction of 8.1 times 10 to the minus 5. And this value is found when the initial concentration of R is 0.76 and that of S is 0.98. Calculate the value for the rate constant at temperature T2. So this time we need to rearrange the rate equation. And so we get K is equal to rate divided by the concentration of R multiplied by the concentration of S squared. Then we substitute these new values in for rate of reaction and for the concentration of R and then the concentration of S, which then needs to be squared. And then when we put those numbers into the calculator, we get 1.1 times 10 to the minus 4 as our value for the rate constant. And finally, they're asking us to deduce which of temperature 1 or temperature 2 is the higher temperature. And all that we have to go on here is our value of the rate constant. So the value of the rate constant initially was 4.2 times 10 to the minus 4. And the value that we've just calculated for the rate constant is 1.1 times 10 to the minus 4. So it is a smaller value for the rate constant at the second temperature, T2. And so the higher temperature is where you will have a larger value for the rate constant. And so T1 is the answer for the higher temperature. And the context is T1 has got the higher rate constant and rate constant is higher if temperature is higher. This second question is a similar sort of concept to the first, only this time we're doing things in reverse. This time we're working with the rate equation that we've been given. And so we know that P is second order and we know that Q is first order. And what that means is that whatever we do to Q, the rate of reaction will be directly proportional to that change. So if we double Q, we'll double the rate of reaction. Whereas P, because it is second order, whatever we do to P gets squared and that happens to the rate of reaction. And so we've got three gaps and we've got some space to do our working out if we need them. But our job is to fill in those three gaps. And so as before, P and Q have been reacted together four times. In the first one, there was a particular set of concentrations and a particular observed rate of reaction. 
Then they change those concentrations in experiment two, and then they change them again in experiment three, and then they change them again in experiment four. And each time there is a piece of information that is missing. So if we compare experiments one and experiments two, first of all, we can see that P has been doubled and Q has also been doubled. And so the rate of reaction will have changed as a direct result of that. And so what we need to be aware of is that P is second order. So since we have doubled the concentration of P, the rate of reaction will be multiplied by that doubling squared. And if that was the only thing that we would, we'd done, the rate of reaction would have been four times bigger. But it's not the only thing we've done. We've also doubled the concentration of Q. And since Q is first order, we're effectively doubling it to the power of one, which means we've doubled it. And so that second effect will have the effect of doubling the rate of reaction. So we have quadrupled the rate of reaction and then we have doubled it again, which of course has an overall effect of meaning that it has been multiplied by eight. And so we need to multiply that 1.8 times 10 to the minus three by eight. And that gives us a final answer of 14.4 times 10 to the minus three. And to fill in our next gap, we could look at experiments two and three, and that's kind of human nature because they're next to each other that we feel like we should look at consecutive values. But I think it's easier if we look at experiments one and three. And so then if we isolate the change to P, P has been multiplied by three. And so this time the rate of reaction would be three times bigger raised to the power of two. So in other words, nine times bigger. So if P was the only thing that had been changed, the rate of reaction would have been multiplied by three to the power of two. So it would have been nine times bigger. And so the rate of reaction would have been 0.0162. And we can see quite clearly that that's not what the rate of reaction is. The rate of reaction is 5.4 times 10 to the minus three. And so what that means is that the change to Q must have turned 0.0162 into 5.4 times 10 to the minus three. And if we find out what that change is, well, this value is three times smaller. So that must mean that the rate of reaction is three times smaller as a direct result of what we've done to Q. Now, Q is first order. So whatever happens to the rate must have been done to Q first. So Q must have been divided by three. And this strategy of having a kind of a part way rate of reaction, I think is really useful. You sort of isolating the individual effects that changing each of the two different concentrations would have had. This first change is tripling P squared, gives us nine times bigger rate. And the second change has caused the dividing by three, which means Q must have been divided by three, which means the concentration of Q in experiment three is 0.10. And then last of all, we need to find the missing concentration of P. In and so I think the easiest thing to do is to once again, go back to experiment one and compare that to experiment four. And the concentration change that we do know of is that Q has been tripled. And so again, if we isolate the effect that that would have, well, since Q is first order, the rate of reaction would be tripled to the power of one. So in other words, that would be tripled. So 5.4 times 10 to the minus three. And then the change that has been affected in P must have caused the rate of reaction to change from 5.4 times 10 to the minus three to 12.2 times 10 to the minus three. And so that is 2.3 times bigger. And so to work out what the change is for the concentration of P, we need to recognize that since the rate has been multiplied by 2.26 or 2.3, then the concentration of P's change squared must be equal to 2.26. So that means that the change in P, whatever P's change was, must be equal to the square root of 2.26. And the square root of 2.26 is 1.5. So what that means is P must have been made 1.5 times bigger because we have squared 1.5 and got 2.26. 
and that has been the change that has happened to the rate of reaction. And so P must have been increased from 0.2 to 0.30. And then part B is very similar to in the previous question. We've been told that we need to use the values from experiment 1 to calculate a value for the rate constant K and deduce its units. So the first thing that we need to do is rearrange the rate equation again, and this time we get K is equal to rate over P concentration squared multiplied by Q concentration. We substitute those values in from experiment 1. So the rate is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 3. P is 0 0.20, but it's squared. And Q is 0 0.30 raised to the power of 1, so 0 0.30. And then our value is 0 0.15. In terms of the units, they've asked us for the units this time. They didn't ask us for those before. Well, what we've got is the units of rate of reaction are moles per decimeter cube per second. So that goes on the top where rate was. Then the units of concentration is moles per decimeter cubed. But we've got three terms because it is P squared and then Q. And so once we've got that expression with its units, those units cancel down a bit. So moles from the top and moles from the bottom, that will cancel out once. And dm minus 3 on the top cancels out with one of the dm minus 3 on the bottom. And so this is what we're left with. Then when we combine the terms on the bottom, we get seconds to the minus 1 over moles squared dm minus 6. And then last of all, the units, everything needs to be on the top row. So we have to bring moles squared from the bottom of the expression. And when we bring that up to the top, the moles squared becomes moles minus 2. And then dm minus 6 from the bottom, when you bring it up to the top, becomes dm6. And so overall, the units of K are mole minus 2, dm6, s to the minus 1. And last of all, we've got a graph. Well, we've got four graphs, and we have to show what the correct relationship is between temperature and the rate constant. And so first of all, we can rule out one of them because it, it doesn't make sense, and that is H. H is definitely wrong because the story of H is that as you increase the temperature, the rate constant is not changing. And that's definitely not the case. We know that temperature increases the value of rate constants pretty much indefinitely. And what that means is we can rule out F as well because it looks like it's coming to a plateau and that no further change in K will happen even if we increase the temperature and that's no good. And so last of all, we're deciding between E and G and the correct answer is G. And the reason that it is G is that there is no linear relationship here because as you increase the temperature, the rate of reaction gets dramatically faster. And it's not linear. It's not like doubling the temperature doubles the rate of reaction. It is far more than that because far greater than double the number of molecules will have energy greater than or equal to the activation energy. So that's why it's going to follow this curved path here because doubling the temperature will do much more than double the rate of reaction, which means it must have done much more than double the rate constant. And I will explore the relationship between temperature and the rate constant in an Arrhenius equation video that I'll release later this week. But for now, that's the end of this video. Hope it was useful. See you again soon.